and the transport, resulting transportation needs of these strategic commodities from producing nations or regions to demanding nations or new regions have become a major global issue. And this is because economic, sustainable, reliable, and safe transportation alternatives for oil and gas are actually not that many. Uh, while they require, in many cases, very large investments and or multinational cooperation and agreements. And in this session, in plenary session, uh, the, the uh, panel members will be presenting and discussing uh, this issue from various aspects and viewpoints. Uh, we were scheduled to have four speakers, but unfortunately, Mr. Nedim is not here with us. Uh, we have Professor, uh, Dr. Jennifer Coolidge, Executive Director of CMX Caspian Gulf from Iraq. And then we have Professor Ivan Gutkov, Moscow State University of International Affairs, Russia. And we have Dr. Hossein Adeli, Secretary General of Gas Exporting Countries Forum from Qatar. And uh, we will have 20, 25 minute presentation from each uh, presenter. And then we will have uh, questions and answers uh, to them all. Okay? Uh, we should start with the floor to Dr. Thank you. particularly as we are in Turkey, to the Turkish and European markets, um, focusing on the Southern Corridor project and also the Turkish Stream project. And while I'll do some focus on this, I think it's pertinent to discuss what, if any, effects sanctions on Russia are having, um, and they have. We will also cover uh, gas inputs from Azerbaijan and the Kurdistan region of northern Iraq. And I'll do an assessment of the uh, Turkish and European markets. So I'm going to start by looking at uh, the situation of the Russia sanctions. So there are a lot of unknowns. And I think one way, and I'm sure our, my Russian colleague here will have plenty to reply to me on, but I want to put out there right away the, the sort of elephant in the room that some may not wish to talk about, um, and that is really the Russian strategy where competing projects or threats to market uh, dominance are concerned. And since the breakup of the former Soviet Union, we've seen a three-part strategy uh, on projects that would compete with Russian gas projects and indeed oil projects. And, and that really is number one, to stop the project if that is impossible. Number two, to co opt the project. Number three, if that is impossible, to compete with the project. And you'll see in my presentation uh, that latter of the three, the competition with the uh, long planned Southern Gas Corridor project. Um, so what about sanctions, to touch on these briefly? Right now, there are no significant energy market effects from Russia sanctions. Uh, this is unlikely until at least 2020, and sanctions would have to continue for years to see any measurable uh, effect. That would require another uh, US administration and indeed other US policymakers to continue with uh, these sanctions. Also, what do the energy sanctions mean? Right now, it's impossible to judge their effect and actually what they refer to and how they will develop. So they're quite ambiguous right now. 
Um, financial sanctions are more easy to uh, look at. They're already affecting Russia's ability to borrow, which could lead to project delays or cancellations in the future. But again, that's very long term and would require continued sustained sanctions uh, for the long term. Three types of sanctions, political, commercial, and trade bans. I won't go into the details if any of you are interested. We could discuss that later. And then the timing of them, really, we've seen effectively about four rounds, although the fourth round has been continuous since, since September of last year. Um, so round one was in the immediate post-annexation of Crimea period. Uh, they were careful in general not to adversely affect Russia's energy sector, only specific tar individuals were targeted. Um, and it, both the EU and the US uh, were uncertain about how strong a response was necessary. So then we saw, moving forward to April, uh, 17 companies and seven individuals targeted, and then uh, travel bans enforced by the EU on 15 individuals. And, and then we move on to July, August last year, um, and there was a higher degree of coordination uh, between the EU and the US after the shootdown of MH, uh, the, the Malaysian Airlines flight over eastern Ukraine. Um, so the EU and the US began to show a willingness to inflict limited measures against the energy sector. So those trade bans, uh, Transaction bans uh, referred to Rosneft, Novatech, Gazprom Bank, Manesh Economic Bank, and a further 23 people and another 11 companies. And then, as you can see, other countries followed suit. Um, so, from September onward, uh, and the escalating conflict, which continues today in eastern Ukraine, um, further measures were taken deep water and shale gas uh, technologies were banned. Um, and that really extends to um, a further asset freeze and sanctioning of 151 further individuals in January, February this year. So you can see it continues to move on. But then I ask, OK, are, the, are these sanctions working? So I feel that ambiguous sanctions and ambiguous goals can lead to ambiguous results. Um, so as we can see, the ruble has bounced back 30% since falling to a low in February, 20, uh, February of this year. Uh, interest rates have fallen, government revenue receipts are up, and there is discussion that the Russian economy could grow from the second half of this year, even without a recovery in oil prices. Uh, inflation is still high, 16.4% uh, last month. And what has Russia's reaction been? It has been to restrict food imports from sanctioning countries. Um, it has pressured Western companies operating in Russia. Uh, and then joint ventures, namely BP and Exxon, could be at risk. Um, so the question is, will the pain of sanctions bring Russia to the negotiating table? I think that's uh, for any of us to judge. So far, it's had little impact on the situation in the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, what are the longer-term Im implications for oil? Uh, really, trade bans and a lack of financing could delay new development, driving down supply projections on gas. That could cause delays in Siberian gas development bound for China. Um, and really, looking at what's happened in the last two years, trust that was built up over the last 20 years between the international community, the West, and Russia has really been undermined. And Europe will certainly work harder to diversify gas supply sources. Um, but as the uh, bottom line points out, right now we have more questions than answers. So into the main part of the presentation, um, I think what's important to look at in global gas demand growth is the right-hand column. And we can see Asia growing between 2012 and 2040 
needing a further 807 billion cubic meters per year. Middle East, and, and I put this up here because I wanted to point this out, that gas demand is growing in the Middle East. We always think of China and India and, and Europe on a more steady track to gas, gas demand growth, but China and India as the big uh, gas-hungry countries. But in fact, Middle East gas demand growth is growing uh, quite rapidly, um, especially in the UAE, uh, which is also an exporter, but is indeed uh, needing to be an importer of gas. So that, um, this is gas production growth, uh, again, highlighting Asian growth, Middle East growth, and uh, Europe down at the bottom at uh, a deficit. So that should give you an overall picture of where gas is needed. But again, we're going to turn back to focus on the uh, Turkish and European markets. So as I said at the beginning, we have two uh, competing projects. Formerly, the South Stream pipeline, which was scrapped in December of 2014 uh, in favor of the new uh, Turkish Stream pipeline, which will have an extension called Tesla, which will go theoretically through Greece, Macedonia, Serbia, and into Hungary, and theoretically to the Baumgarten hub in Austria. So we have that project, which is an ostensibly a 60 BCM per year project. Half of that gas would be used in Turkey, uh, and half could potentially go onward to Europe. It's a four pipeline project. Notably, uh, $2 billion has already been uh, designated to subcontractors by Gazprom. Uh, the pipeline has already reached the Ruskaya compressor station and would need to move onward into southern Russia, cross the Black Sea into Turkey, move towards Greece and onward. And I do feel that because so much investment uh, has taken place and that the, the gas is already, uh, the gas infrastructure is already partly in place, that we will see at least one of those strings uh, built and possibly two to serve the Turkish market. Russia would have no other way to serve the Turkish market more than an additional 3 billion cubic meters of gas per year, which was slated to come through the existing Blue Stream pipeline. So that's uh, the Russian perspective. This is a picture, a map of the Southern Corridor. You see with the South uh, Caucasus pipeline in purple on Azerbaijan on the right. I don't know if there's a pointer here, probably not. Um, but on the far right, moving to the Tanat pipeline across Turkey, moving to the Trans-Adriatic pipeline in red across Greece and the Adriatic to Italy. And that pipeline, uh, basically we already have the South Caucasus pipeline in existence um, and, oh, thank you. And uh, that delivers gas to the Turkish market from Shaktani's phase one to the, the uh, terminus point in Erzurum and then into the Turkish grid. The extension of this or expansion of this pipeline would provide a further, so the six BCM of gas to Turkey already would provide a further six BCM per year of gas to Turkey and 10 BCM of gas to Europe. Uh, could carry more gas from Azerbaijan incrementally as it is available. I'm going to switch to this slide for a second. So um, this shows you the timing and the source supply of uh, gas into the southern corridor. So we can see that, um, I may not be technologically, okay, here we go. We can see that these gas fields in Azerbaijan could deliver potentially substantial quantities of gas, unspecified timing for ACG deep level and, and this slew of others, um, 20 to 25 BCM per year by 2020 uh, from Shah Deniz's phases one and two. We have Iraq here, and I should say I'm based in the Kurdistan region of Iraq and Erbil and work on issues pertaining to both oil and gas development there. 
Um, we could see 5 to 10 BCM of gas into the Turkish market by 2020. Uh, the contract between the Kurdistan regional government and Turkey calls for 4 BCM of gas by 2017 and 10 BCM of gas by 2020. Uh, I have a question mark next to Federal Iraq here. Uh, formerly, gas was slated to come potentially into the Turkish and European markets uh, from a field called Akas that's currently in an area largely controlled by ISIS and the fourth bid round uh, underway under exploration in, in Federal Iraq. Those uh, results are still a question mark, but I think the most significant thing about gas development in federal Iraq is the amount of flaring that currently uh, continues because of the inability of the Basra Gas Company project, which is a joint venture between Shell, Mitsubishi, and the government to really get off the ground. Um, there is a lack of communication between the Ministry of Oil and the Ministry of Electricity and the Basra Gas Company and the first licensing round holders, uh, the big companies operating fields such as West Kurna and Rumela uh, and Majnun. So that is problematic for the time being. I don't see any hope of gas exports from federal Iraq in the uh, near or medium term, or indeed probably even the long term, given the deficit uh, and the need for power generation. Uh, Turkmenistan, I put here, I don't see Turkmen gas crossing the Caspian due to objections by Russia, long-standing objections. Also, uh, Azerbaijan with uh, questionable timing for incremental gas supplies. I would question why Azerbaijan would want to let Turkmen gas compete with its own. And Turkmenistan has largely um, mortgaged its future to China which has the first and second phases of the supergiant South Yolatan, now also called Galkanish field. Um, but I've put in some timings and amounts here. East Med gas, not in substantial amounts of gas, but deep water exploration, quite expensive. Uh, recent contracts signed by Israel with Egypt and Jordan trump Cyprus's ability to uh, export gas on its own. It really needs, with a $10 billion financial bailout and a $10 billion project at Basilicos, I question how Cyprus's project could go forward without uh, going forward in tandem with Israel, which has now decided on other markets. Uh, both countries were looking at uh, high Asian LNG prices, which by the time those projects are ready to deliver gas will likely not uh, be there. I, mean, I see, um, and I'll go back to the former slide, I see a, a leveling out of pricing between Henry Hub, NBP, and Asia. So what are the important things in terms of gas markets? I think they remain very uncertain. I, I want to underline that. After the financial crisis, and gas demand constriction, especially in Europe, and the shale gas glut, uh, which right now is being uh, tamed by the low pricing in the US and the rates being laid up for both unconventional gas and oil development in the US. I think we're going to see, uh, in the future, increasing competition and price volatility. Um, as I said, I think the, the three, the discrepancies between pricing from the US, Europe, and Asia will gradually level. They won't equalize, but they'll become more level. Um, I think also we're seeing the European gas market undergoing a paradigm shift with a trajectory to a tighter supply demand balance in the next few years, and gas prices moving away, as you're aware, from oil indexation toward an equilibrium where pricing will be determined at hubs. Uh, where global LNG is concerned, uh, next year or the year after, I think we will begin to see the full potential of where the trajectory of LNG exports from the US is going. Right now, we have uh, quite a, a decrease in exploration, but that is still an unknown, and I don't think we'll know 
where unconventional gas development stands in Europe, the success or uh, increase in it until after 2020. So that leaves several questions. Turkish gas market for one, um, Turkish gas demand could rise to 50 to 60 BCM per year by 2020, and possibly even to 80 BCM per year by 2030. Uh, in terms of gas uh, exports from, uh, to Europe from a place like the Kurdistan region of Iraq, the net backs for that long distance, given the sales price, for Kurdistan region gas in Turkey may not make sense, meaning the border price. Um, and then finally, I think the realization of the TANAP pipeline uh, will depend on Azerbaijan's decision making and EU gas demand trajectory. Yes, there was a, uh, a foundation laying for the TANAP pipeline. You are probably all aware that for a period of at least five years, there was the great debate between the Nabucco pipeline, uh, would the Italy-Turkey-Greece interconnector be realized, would the Trans-Adriatic pipeline be realized, would the Turkish grid be used? And so I think we're still, although certain uh, amounts of money have been designated both by Russia and by uh, Azerbaijan and its partners for development of different pipelines, we're still in this um, what I might call a settling phase. It has yet to become clear with the TANAP pipeline whether it would be a 48-inch pi uh, pipeline or a 52-inch pipeline. When will Azerbaijan be able to uh, put more gas into that pipeline? And, and so I think you see a variety of questions which um, have a, an effect on decision-making. So another pipeline picture showing uh, Kurdistan region's connection into the extension of the Turkish grid here. This uh, actually is a picture of the original Kurdistan region pipeline, which was slated to be gas, and when uh, at a point in 2014 was decided to trans form this into an oil pipeline, which is the currently functioning oil pipeline that's bringing Kurdistan region oil to Jehan. Um, but a gas pipeline is slated for the same uh, Kermala Fishkabur corridor, and 41 kilometers of that pipeline, 36-inch uh, pi pipeline, has already been built. Uh, so this is a graphic view of the timing of incremental gas into the southern quarter, and I should say that where the, the Turkish Stream project is concerned, it functions for uh, Europe and the potential for sending gas to Europe largely as a Ukraine bypass, given the uh, current conflict in Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine, and where Turkish Stream does bring new gas is bringing more, uh, greater quantities of gas into the Turkish market. Um, so you can see these are the amounts slated from Azerbaijan uh, and, and the, the destination and the timeline and from where. And I've tried to put Kurdistan region gas on the same timeline as the Azeri for a more direct uh, comparison. Turkish gas demand, these are just visuals looking at Turkish gas demand and pricing. And one thing I should say is that, um, you know, if Russia's Turkish stream project is to be successful, it would have to undercut these competitors. So that uh, Azerbaijan gas right now is uh, less expensive than Russian and certainly Iranian gas into the Turkish market. Uh, Kurdistan region gas would come in below, uh, at a lower price than the Shaktanese phase two gas and probably right around Shaktanese phase one gas. And so that's not insignificant, but we have seen a willingness potentially um, indicated 
by an increase in deliveries in March of this year of Russian gas to Europe, potentially of discounts to be given. I think Russia is in a situation now where it is really considering uh, Europe was its long-standing guaranteed market. And, and the political conflict aside, uh, it needs to look, Russia is looking more at um, where the long term sits. China has locked up substantial volumes of gas from Turkmenistan uh, for the long term, and long standing negotiations between Russia and China really made for a situation where Russia did not want to give the pricing discounts that China wanted. And so we see this sort of gas game going on through, throughout Eurasia, and I don't think we've seen that settle yet. Um, this is a slide showing European gas demand and pricing, uh, piped gas, and also LNG. So really, uh, I'm going to finish up here with what, what's the bottom line um, for the Southern Corridor, at least, is, is how fast, number one, how fast incremental gas comes on stream in Azerbaijan and indeed the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, how fast Turkish and European gas demand indeed do grow. Uh, Azerbaijan and the Kurdistan region's ability to undercut competitors in the Turkish market, specifically Russia, and to a much lesser extent Iran because of much lower uh, inputs into the Turkish system. Um, fourth, the delinkage of oil indexed gas prices in Europe and a new market equilibrium focused on regional hubs. And lastly, the solidification, as I mentioned, of the global LNG market and uh, if and when US and EU unconventional gas arise in the second half of this decade. So I'm going to stop there. I think I've covered uh, a lot of territory. And hopefully, I'll set this up well for my colleague from Mukimo and Gazprom to continue. Thank you. And now I'd like to give the floor to the Professor. Multilateral agreement 
the so-called Convention on Ensuring International Energy Security. And at the end of 2010, Russia presented a draft of this new instrument to the international community. One of the main reasons for a Russian decision to terminate provisional application of ECT and to propose an alternative was the ability of ECT to efficiently cope with two crisis events that occurred with transit of Russian gas through Ukrainian territory in 2006 and in 2009. However, the work on the Russian initiative is currently frozen, and as regards modernization of the charter process, we see uh, some uh, progress, uh, you know, that uh, several days ago, on May um, 20, uh, a new International Energy Charter was adopted, but still it is just a new political declaration, it's not a legally binding document. And uh, if we speak about ECT, uh, we shall note that uh, without modification of a number of its uh, provisions, this instrument still remains to be quite risky for its participants and um, unattractive for accession of new parties. For example, uh, investment and transit provisions of ECT contain a number of serious contradictions and have a vague wording that decreases predictability of the enforcement and as regards particularly uh, transit provisions, uh, this ambiguity undermines efficiency of these transit provisions. At the regional level, uh, Russia operates with the post-Soviet states in the framework of Commonwealth of Independent States, established uh, in, 2000, in um, 1991, and within Eurasian Economic Community, established in 2000. Uh, within the framework of uh, Community of Independent States, uh, its participants adopted a number of quite important documents in the energy sphere, like concept of cooperation between member states in the field of energy. They formed the CIS Electric Power Council, signed the agreement on the parallel operation of electric power systems, the agreement on transit of the electric energy and capacity, and an agreement on the formation of a common electric power market. Within the framework of EURASEC, its participants adopted the fundamentals of energy policy of the Eurasian Economic Community, approved the concept of formation of a common energy market of Eurozec member states, and concluded an agreement on joint development of the energy balance of the Eurasian Economic Community's member states. Uh, on January 1, 2015, Eurozec was liquidated and it was replaced by a more serious form of economic integration by the Eurasian Economic Union, which now consists of four countries, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia. The interaction within the Eurasian Economic Union, including energy cooperation, is regulated by the Treaty on the Eurasian Economic Union. The international treaties previously concluded in the framework of Eurozec are gradually transferred into the legal framework of the Eurasian Economic Union. On a bilateral basis, the Russian Federation has concluded dozens of, dozens of international treaties on cooperation in various energy sectors with a wide range of partner countries from Europe, Asia and America. The treaties regulate trade, transit and investment cooperation in the energy sector, as well as define conditions for realization of major infrastructure projects, including oil and gas cross-border transmission. Russia is involved in the energy dialogues with key country, countries and partner regions. Uh, in 2000, uh, the energy dialogue was established between Russia and the EU, and in, in 2008, Russia-China energy dialogue was established. This mechanism uh, allows Russia and China to bring the discussion of topical issues of their energy preparation to a fundamentally new level. Presently, within the framework of Russia-China energy dialogue, the interaction of state bodies and commercial enterprises of both countries is ensured in all areas of cooperation. So now I would like to say a few words about our current issues in EU-Russia energy relations. So despite the interdependence and long history of successful energy cooperation between Russia and its main trading partner, the European Union, 
In recent years, a number of issues have arisen in this sphere, and uh, unfortunately, the resolution of these issues is not facilitated by the current political background. Firstly, retrospective application of structural requirements of new European energy legislation to the Russian network assets in the EU deprived the Russian supplier of its rights over these assets, and this significantly affected its investment interests. Secondly, in 2009, the European Commission imposed a conditional ban on the Russian gas supplier to use more than half of all gas pipeline capacity. This pipeline is an onshore continuation of Nord Stream on the territory of Germany. Since the lion's share uh, of costs for construction of Opal had been incurred by the Russian supplier, this ban actually became a severe restriction of the Russian supplier's ownership right. Thirdly, in 2012, the European Commission initiated an antitrust investigation against the Russian gas supplier on the ground of alleged abuse of dominant position in eight countries of Central and Eastern Europe. One of the key suspicions is the alleged use of unfair prices, even though for more, for more than 40 years uh, history of Russian gas supplies to the EU, such allegation has never been put forward. Another issue is the European Commission's blocking of the South Stream project, which became one of the main reasons for stopping this project. The European Commission's resistance to South Stream was expressed in particular in its request to rewrite all international treaties concluded on the project between Russia and European host countries so that they would be in line with regulatory standards of the European Union. Such a request was perceived by Russia as being contrary to the Sunsarwanda principle and in practical terms meant depriving the Russian supplier of right to possess the pipeline and make full use of its capacity. In general, this set of problems should be considered in light of the European Union policy of decarbonization and diversification. Decarbonization is aimed at transition of the EU economy on renewable energy sources by 2050. At the same time, within diversification policy, the EU gives a clear priority to the southern corridor for import of pipeline gas from new sources and to construction of regasification facilities to import liquefied natural gas. So, the legal response of Russia to these issues was the initiation of a dispute with the European Union and the World Trade Organization in April 2014 on discrimination of Russian gas and related services as well as a number of investment disputes initiated by Russian investors. Political and commercial reaction of Russia is, refle is reflected in active diversification of Russian supply markets in the eastern direction. In the oil industry, the policy of supply market diversification has been carried out by Russia for quite a long time. In 2009, the first stage of the pipeline system Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean was commissioned, and in 2012, its second stage. For the gas industry, the starting point in this respect was 2014. On October 13, 2014, Russia signed an agreement with China on cooperation in the sphere of natural gas supply on the so-called Eastern Route. Earlier, in May 2014, the largest 30-year contract for export of Russian gas to China was concluded, and the construction of the gas pipeline Power of Siberia was launched. The next step is realization of the pipeline project Altai, western route for the supply of pipeline gas to China. Russia also plans to realize a number of projects for the production of liquefied natural gas that will allow to supply LNG to different geographic markets. With regard to further work on the European Union market, the Russian gas supplier announced revision of its previously conducted strategy of approaching the European end consumer. Turkish Stream project with declared capacity of up to 63 BCM of gas per year, was announced as a substitute for South Stream project. <coughs> Turkish Stream is expected to be built from Russia to the border of Turkey and Greece, and this project is perceived by Russia as a means to exclude dependency on increasingly unreliable Ukrainian gas transit system and mitigate associated risks. Uh, so these transit risks, uh, they um, materialized already in 2006 and 2009, and since then they have increased, uh, in particular during the well-known crisis events, 
in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, the crisis events on the southeast part of this country. As such, as a new, uh, maybe perceived as a new menace to uh, transit of gas uh, through Ukraine, but at the same time, certain new measures were adopted by Ukrainian state that create additional transit risks. Uh, for example, new legislation was passed in Ukraine last year, which permits the Ukrainian government to impose a ban on Russian gas transit through uh, the territory of the state. Uh, and also, um, Ukraine has passed legislation which prohibits Russian investors to participate as a shareholder in the Ukrainian gas transit system. So it allows only European and American uh, investors to buy shares in the Ukrainian gas transit system, but not Russian investors. And uh, another <coughs> um, area of concern is Ukrainian demand to considerably raise uh, gas transit uh, tariff, uh, although this uh, gas transit tariff is fixed in the long-term gas transit contract. So all these factors, they increase significantly risks of transit of gas for the territory of Ukraine and make Russia uh, seek for another uh, route to supply its target markets. So from 2020, when the current contract on transit of Russian gas through Ukraine will expire, the Russian gas supplier is expected to use new Turkish Stream together with existing Nord Stream, Yamal Europe and Blue Stream. The combined capacity of these systems will be sufficient for the Russian supply to fulfill its long-term supply commitments before the European and Turkish customers. What is important in this respect is that Turkish Stream is promoted as a tool for transit routes diversification and not as an instrument to increase the share of Russian gas on the European market. So, the future of Russian relations with the European Union, its traditional energy partner, depends largely on the successful resolution of the aforementioned issues and overall improvement of the current political background. There are good reasons for the parties to finally come to constructive solutions instead of pursuing mutual claims and trials. After all, the interdependence of Russia and the EU in the energy sector, despite the ongoing diversification policy of both parties, will continue at least in the medium term. With regard to development of Russian energy relations with new partners, including the Asian countries, the main prospects here are related to the realization of the pipeline projects Power of Siberia, Altai, and construction of new LNG projects in Russia. In this respect, it is important that on December 1, 2013, the legal regime for export of LNG from Russia was liberalized. In addition to Gazprom and its subsidiaries, the right to export LNG was also granted to independent gas producers, privately owned Novatec, state control no Rosneft and their subsidiaries. Therefore, uh, LNG from the Novatec led project Yamal LNG, which is currently under construction, will be able to enter the world market in the foreseeable future. Gazprom in turn is also aimed at accelerated realization of new LNG production projects intended to increase the company's share on the global gas market. The company develops Vladivostok LNG project, which is particularly important to increase supply of Russian gas to the Asia-Pacific market. And the company is also developing Baltic LNG project on the shore of the Baltic Sea and considers possibility to increase capacity of the second two LNG project, which is currently the only LNG project operational in Russia. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lutkov. And uh, now we we'll give the floor to our third speaker, Dr. Radili.
Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Rehan and also uh, uh, Professor Gurkhan uh, Kambaraglu for inviting me to this very uh, August uh, organization. I would like uh, also to congratulate them for the very successful uh, uh, organization of this uh, conference. Uh, as a matter of fact, what I would like to share with you is uh, the GCF uh, uh, views on uh, the global condition which is uh, prevailing over the gas market and the uh, factors which is impacting uh, the, this market and reshaping the market, of course, it would also impact the transportation on this. So uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of publicity on GCF, and then uh, I'll go to, uh, uh, to talk about uh, the production and the trade of uh, gas, which is really uh, would shape the, would reshape the transportation. And of course, uh, then I would uh, have uh, some conclusion. Well, on GCF, as you know, the Gas Exporting Countries Forum, uh, was established in 2001 in Tehran, Iran, but then in 2008 it uh, turned to be a full-fledged uh, international organization uh, with now seven, uh, 18 member countries. Six of them are observers and the rest are full member countries. It's a small cosmopolitan organization starting from Americas, uh, we have uh, Bolivia, Peru, Trinidad and Tobago and Venezuela. Then in uh, Europe we have Norway and uh, Netherlands. And in Africa we have Equatorial Guinea, Nigeria, Algeria, Libya and Egypt. Then uh, in, uh, we have Russia, Kazakhstan, and then Iran. And in the Persian Gulf we have uh, Qatar, uh, UAE and uh, Oman and of course Iraq as well as the observers. So this organization is responsible for 67% of uh, uh, global gas reserves, 65% of the LNG trade and 40% of the pipeline trade. So if you look at this uh, 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 slide, you would see that uh, in terms of production, in terms of export, in terms of, and in all regions it has fairly large percentage of the gas of that region. Is if you look at uh, uh, in, in Americas, in South and Central America, Europe, so the trade between GCF member countries and the rest of the world is pretty large uh, numbers. Then uh, let me turn into a little bit of uh, uh, trying to depict for you the picture of how the gas market is evolving very fastly, especially in the past couple of years. We have seen lots of developments that is taking place and is reshaping the whole gas market in the world. And I have here enumerated the, uh, several factors that would, you would see that these are the main factors uh, which is really changing the dynamics of the gas market right now. I would like to start with uh, shell gas. Of course, shell gas, as it's called, shell gas revolution in the United States, uh, has turned the uh, United States from a net uh, importer of uh, gas, which is still a net importer, to a, a potential net exporter of gas in the next couple of years. So we anticipate that in 2016, late 2016 and 2017, uh, we see uh, the first cargoes of LNG would be exported from the United States. So this is one. And of course, the main uncertainty and question about the shell gas is whether the shell gas can be replicated in other places or not. And the uh, efforts that have been made in the past uh, years uh, have not yet been successful, except for the example of China, which is producing a very a small amount of uh, shell gas there, but in Europe, in uh, Poland, where there is some shell gas, in France and the UK, there are shell gas, but uh, still it is, uh, in, in France, of course, it's banned by law, and in UK, it has started to be uh, thought of, and it's under review, and in Poland, the last 
few years uh, uh, efforts by several companies have not yet uh, yielded to any result. So this is about Shell Gas, which has uh, uh, brought up the new dynamics in the, in the market. The second thing is the new exporters and the new producers. Actually, uh, uh, I mean, previously, or the prevailing exporters in the market was Russia, was Qatar, and Middle East, and uh, uh, some African countries, such as in Algeria. But now we see that there are lots of exporters which is coming, some of them potentially going to uh, outpace the existing ones. For example, Australia, which is in, in, in a matter of uh, three years, it uh, might be outpacing uh, Qatar uh, in LNG export. And uh, we have uh, Mozambique in Africa, we have Angola, we have Tanzania. So uh, there are lots of new exporters, including, of course, the United States of America which uh, these new exporters are potentially uh, bringing a new shape into the global gas market. Then uh, the, the third is, uh, of course, uh, uh, what we call a post-Fukushima policies, which, uh, the, uh, of course, the, the uh, largest LNG importer of the world is, uh, is Japan. And, uh, and it uh, increased its imports because of the uh, shutting down of 45, uh, of 54 uh, uh, nuclear power stations. Now that Japan is uh, uh, rethinking about uh, opening its uh, and reactivating its nuclear power, uh, uh, nuclear power plants, so the demand is, is very sluggish. Of course, in the past, Europe was the first in the demand, now, uh, the demand even not only now is uh, is not uh, is very steady and is, is very uh, down in, in Europe but also in other places we see that uh, demand is not picking up in these uh, uh, years but of course in the, in the in the long run we have we see that the demand would be almost double but then I go to the energy policies actually, uh, as a result of the uh, uh, financial crisis that we had uh, in the past uh, years, we see that uh, some European countries have already chosen coal, uh, uh, I mean, against uh, gas. So we see that the energy policy is also is a very important factor here, which would shape the, uh, uh, the, the demand. Um, and, and of course, uh, we anticipate that in the in the next uh, few years, we would see that uh, the climate change uh, uh, commitments and obligations would also impact the energy policies. As uh, we are approaching to the COP21 in Paris in December 2015, we might see that uh, the commitments that have been made already by, by different uh, regions and different countries would uh, favor gas in uh, against the other uh, fossil fuels, as it is the cleanest fossil fuel uh, which is uh, which can be used. Then we have two other uh, factors which also is reshaping the gas uh, market. One is the increase in the energy trade, which I, uh, I will come back to that in more detail, which has uh, made a, a more flexibility in the market, and also the prices. The prices, uh, of course, the fall of the price of the of oil impacted the price of, uh, of gas, and uh, as you know, we have uh, had uh, four, uh, four uh, price four regions of the prices from Henry Hub of the United States to the NDP of, of uh, UK and to the European market and to the Far East uh, Asia. These four markets were quite uh, uh, divergent in the past. Um, something uh, last year it was around in japan it was around the 17 to uh, 19 dollar per million btu whereas uh, in henry hall was something around four dollar or five dollar at, at that time so it was quite f falling apart w uh, whereas now we see that the the prices are converging so this is why it is uh, quite coming uh, close to uh, maybe in some time you would see that uh, there is more flexibility in the market. Then, having said about that, let me now go to the uh, to the production and the trade 
which uh, I believe would shape the market. Let me start with the, with the natural resources. You know, we have uh, 504 uh, TCM of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, gas resources, out of which uh, we see that uh, we have only uh, 210 of these is, uh, how can I, can I use this? So if, if you look at the, at the right uh, side of, of, the, uh, uh, of the slide, you will see that, that uh, by hydrothermal type, uh, something around 210 of the resources are proven reserves, and the rest, uh, which is around 290, is not uh, the proven reserves. And the, when we are talking about not proven reserves, we're talking about the unconventional and also the unconventional unconven yet to find. So this means that the, the main driver of the growth of production would be, uh, would be two uh, uh, bulk of the, of the reserves, which is of the resources, which is one is yet to find and the other one is the unconventional. This means that the uh, production and uh, the reserves, there are some degree of uncertainty in this. So uh, this is number one. And number two, by the regions, we see that there are six regions in the world that uh, 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 the world can rely on. Uh, first is CIS, the second is uh, Middle East, the third is Africa, uh, the, the fourth is North America, and then we have uh, non-OECD, Asia, and last is Latin America. If we go ahead uh, on the production, we see also uh, the same kind of uh, combination that uh, in, in, in the long run, we, we see that in North America, CIS, Middle East, non-OECD Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the same six uh, regions would be uh, the dominant uh, region of the, of the production. Uh, but of course, uh, and the trade, would uh, increase from 1 TCM to something around 2.2 uh, TCM, which is uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, here in the, in the chart below, we've seen uh, the, the red one is the indig indigenous trade of gas, and the blue one is the international trade. As you know that gas has always been something uh, uh, like a domestic uh, commodity rather than international commodity which is now, we see that international trade of gas is becoming more and more. Then, uh, uh, let's now turn into the trade. On the, on the global uh, gas trade growth, as I said, uh, in, uh, uh, from now until 2040, uh, we see that uh, one TCM of international uh, of trade of gas would become 2.2. This means that 2.7% is the annual growth rate of, uh, of this, which uh, of, the, of the trade, which if we uh, look at the LNG, which is different from the pipeline, the LNG growth uh, of the trade would be 3.4, which is much more than the pipeline trade or the, and uh, we see that uh, the, uh, the LNG, uh, this is uh, the division between pipeline and LNG. Now it is something around 70% pipeline trade, 30% LNG. But uh, in 2014, uh, the LNG would rise to something around 40%, 41% of, uh, of the trade, which uh, this significantly uh, change uh, the uh, transportation, at least the uh, kind of uh, instruments that is needed for, for this. On international gas trade, here what I would like to uh, suggest is, is uh, to point out is uh, that as you see in 2014, we have the domestic supply and the international trade, and we see that in the incremental, which is uh, as, as, as you see that uh, domestic uh, 70 to uh, 30, it would be uh, rising to uh, almost 40%. But the incremental increase, if you see that the incremental is both uh, divided between the domestic, the indigenous, and the international trade, 50-50. I 
I mean, it's uh, 1,200 vis-a-vis 